So who am I? I'm Steve Wade. I'm an independent q and um, consultant and trainer. I'm currently platform lead at, at Metal. I've um, contributed to a number of different tools. The main one that we're going to talk about in this list is Flux. Um, this talk is quite high level. Um, I've actually documented in quite a lot of blog posts in more detail. Um, so feel free to kind of check them out and, and reach out to me if you've got any further questions. So what is Metal? Well, Metal is a, um, a venture inside of um, RBS, which was set up to provide business banking to our customers. So um, digital business banking, so no bricks and mortars. You can't go into a metal store or a metal branch and speak to someone. It's all done um, via the telephone or, a, or the metal mobile app. So I want to start with this quote from Kelsey because I think this really kind of sets the scene nicely. So Kelsey said, once you found success, your next goal should be helping others to do the same. And what I'm going to do is replace success with a pattern that works. And at Metal, we found a pattern that works really well for us. And this whole presentation is about the journey that we've been on the last 18 uh, months to two years um, to explain why we went on that, some of the lessons that we've learned, and hopefully you can kind of uh, take that back to your organization and implement it. One thing you'll note about this slide is I've deliberately missed off the number of retweets and likes I had because it is embarrassingly pathetic compared to Kelsey's. Um, so we're going to start with what was this question, this unanswerable question that I got asked very early on um, at my tenure at Metal. Um, th then we're going to talk about this mission statement and the mission statement that we constructed to be able to answer this question and other questions that we were asked. Then we'll dig into a little bit more of the details, so the implementation. And then finally, we'll, uh, we'll answer the question, can we answer the question now? So when I think of banking, I think a lot of, a lot of this, right? Got guys in suits high-fiving each other when they've made deals. But the real thing that we want to see from a technical standpoint is all of this red tape that gets put in place, right? Slow releases, you know, big bang releases, change approval boards. You know, we've all, we've all been there. We've all experienced them. And why Metal was kind of span up, I think, was for us to be able to show a new way of working and doing things differently. But because of that, this happened. So imagine this as everybody else within RBS and, and you know other areas of the business. They were always intrigued in what we were doing, right? Some of them um, because they wanted to learn new things, some of them because they were envious. But because of that, this was me trying to explain to them how everything we were doing was okay. Uh, you know, we, we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. We know what we're doing, just, just trust in us, right? The classic consultant line, everything's gonna be all right. So, spoiler, what was the question? The question that I got asked was, how long would it take to rebuild an environment? And I kind of answered with a shrug. And I was like, well, you know, we don't need to rebuild an environment, right? We're leveraging Kubernetes. It does desired state reconciliation. We delete a pod, a new one comes back up. We delete a node, another node comes up. Like, why do we really need to bother about this? And then I thought to myself, actually, you've asked me a question that I don't know the answer to, and that doesn't really sit well with me as a professional, right? And the fact that I can't give you an answer, and you know, I'm a consultant that's coming in to help you, it doesn't sit well with me. And we, we need to be able to get an answer to this question. So we kind of went on this, this platform rebuild, and we're gonna talk about platform V1 and platform V2. So platform V2, what's there now? Platform V1, what was there when I, when I joined? So we took a look at Platform V1 and, you know, there were a couple of things that kind of stuck out to us that made answering this question very difficult. Uh, some of those were around the ability to be able to perform automation. So we automated some of the infrastructure, but not all of it. Um, to give you an example, the EC2 instances were automated. The DNS was not. Um, apparently, DNS had to be done manually at the time. Um, the way that we onboarded new microservices was very manual. Um, the, the platform engineering team had to actually execute the first um, time the application got onboarded onto the cluster. And then every other time after that, the developers could use their, their CICD tooling to be able to deploy that. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to start with a mission statement. And for any of you that are familiar with, with technology, the more buzzwords you can fit in this mission statement, the more likely the business are to agree that this is a good idea. So we started with this mission statement. 
to provide an easily recoverable, so if we can recover it, we can answer the question that I couldn't answer earlier. Consistent platform, because that was something that we didn't have in V1. We had a large level of inconsistency because we were doing things manually. And everyone knows when you do things manually, you're going to get inconsistency. And then finally, there was this one around ownership and self-service to developers. So we wanted the right people to be owning the right areas of the platform. And we wanted to allow the developers to be able to innovate and not block them, right? So it was getting the right separation of concerns with regards to teams. So quick story of um, what the infrastructure looks like. So we run heavily on Amazon. We deploy the Kubernetes cluster on top of that. And then we want to run the meta workloads. Simple, right? Relatively trivial. Why are you giving a 30 minute presentation on this? So when we started this replatforming, we had a decision to make, right? Do we push changes into the cluster or do we pull them? And we thought long and hard about this. And we thought about all of the issues that we were having in the past. So a prime example was for us to be able to deploy a, a, a change of an alert in Prometheus, we were deploying the whole Prometheus Helm chart. But as a developer, that's pretty unengaging, right? For them to understand how this Helm, Helm chart is constructed. They don't need to understand that. They just need an interface where they can construct things and a way of syncing those changes into the cluster. That's something very, very trivial, like a config of an alert. But if we take that all the way to you know, changes to the infrastructure or the way a new application gets deployed, if we can pull them in, we are declaring the state that we would like the system to be in out of band of the platform existing. Right, so we can stand up and tear down the platform as many times as we want, and we will get back to the desired state that we have in, in Git. So we went with Flux. Flux was a choice that we, um, that we decided to go with with regards to GitOps tools. Um, the reason why we decided to do that was because the developers had already spent a lot of time constructing uh, concourse pipelines, the heavy users of concourse, and we essentially wanted to hook GitOps into their existing pipelines. We didn't want them to have to re-implement everything. Um, we were already re-implementing a platform. If we tried to re-implement the whole of their CI CD pipeline, we would have never got this thing shipped. And the reason why this really spoke to us was a, you know, a couple of things. Everything that you see on the bottom right or inside the dashed box is stuff that's running inside Kubernetes. So the long and short of this is, you have an agent inside the cluster, which is Flux CD in this perspective. And Flux CD is going to do this kind of two directional sync. So it's going to sync with a Git repository or a number of Git repositories. And then it's going to have this way of being able to poll for new images. So when we think about new images, think about releasing new versions of microservices. And what we've done is we've stopped people being able to do kubectl apply. So on the bottom left there um, to reduce the privileges down that people need to be able to make changes to the cluster. So if we drive everything through with Git, we get a nice you know, auditability um, perspective. We get um, you know, better controls of over who can do what to, to what environment. And just generally, we, we have a way of being able to understand the source of truth of the platform, right? If we allow people to be able to manually apply changes um, via, via kubectl or tweak or change the structure of the platform, they will not be stored anywhere. Well, they may be stored in people's laptops in their in their history, um, but we're never going to be able to resurrect the platform back to what it looked like before. So if we can set Flux up right and we can get this syncing, we're going to be able to get the, cons the easily recoverable, right? We're going to stand up the cluster and all these fluxes are going to reconcile and we'll we'll get back to where we were. But the consistency piece is the kind of the really important piece, right? How do we get cookie cutter environments? You know, we've got a number of environments that we have now. As everybody knows, developers love new environments because they want to test out a new thing or platform engineering want to, you know, be able to run stress tests or, you know, practice migrations. So we need a way of being able to cookie cutter these environments. So the way we do that is with this kind of three character environment prefix, and that flows all the way through the whole, the whole infrastructure, all of the applications, everything. So we do that within DNS. We do that, and that flows through all of our GitOps um, repositories. 
And then finally in our microservice image tags, and I'm gonna kind of gloss over that very quickly because we're gonna get onto that a bit later. So now with regards to clear ownership. So the way that we're gonna get clear ownership is we're gonna have separate repositories with different code owners. So different code owners, people that are able to approve PRs that make specific or different types of changes to the whole entire platform. So how are the repositories structured? So before we kind of go into that, I wanna quickly talk about the Helm operator. So we had previously in platform V1, all of the microservices were deployed using Helm. All of the application repositories had their own unique Helm charts. As you can imagine, a lot of inconsistency. They developers love to copy and paste. All engineers love, you know, all engineers love to do that. But not everybody is a Kubernetes expert, and nor should they have to be, right? But they don't know what they're copying and pasting. So there was a lot of inconsistency and there was a lot of understanding and burden that were put on developers. And we wanted to remove that from them and provide them with an interface to onboard new applications. So before Concourse was pushing changes in to the Kubernetes clusters using, using Helm, what the Helm operator does is it's another agent that sits with inside the cluster. And its job is to reconcile what we call custom um, Helm resources or Helm releases. So rather than us having a plethora of Helm charts, we now have a single uh, back-end Helm chart and we are going to instantiate a number of Helm releases and that will be the way that developers now onboard new microservices into the cluster. So what is a Helm release? So a Helm release essentially looks a little bit like this. It's, it's a YAML file if you're familiar with Kubernetes, you're going to have to become very familiar with YAML. That's all everyone he talks about. So a Helm release has a release name, and that release name needs to be unique um, in the whole entire cluster. Then it has a chart, and you provide it with a, a location for that chart, whether that be a, a chart repository, whether that be a GitHub URL or a, or a um, GitHub link. And then the name of the chart and the version that you want to deploy. And then underneath that sits all the values that you want to specify. So very similar to values.yaml if you're familiar with a Helm chart, but now we're doing it in a single um, location rather than um, a Helm chart per microservice. And then one of the great things about Helm releases is it provides us with these annotations. So these two annotations here are saying, I'm going to allow you to do automatic image updates and I'm going to allow you to perform them against the image that I've specified where it matches this semantic version. So if we deployed or created a new container image of pod info at 3.0.1, Flux would go and see that and Flux would deploy 3.0.1 for us. So we don't have to make changes to the cluster. Flux is going to do this for us. Remember that kind of bi-directional sync of, of image tags. This is going to become very prevalent of how we deploy changes through environments. So the way all this works is that we start with a repository called Kubernetes resources. And Kubernetes resources is where the, the vanilla or bare bones of the cluster comes up. So replace kind of Kubernetes resources with cluster bootstrapping slash platform engineering workloads. So in here, in here we've got things like Prometheus, we've got um, Kibana, we've got Grafana, but we've also got all of the role-based access control policies to you know, allow developers and engineers to be able to interact with the Kubernetes cluster the way that we would like them to interact with it. So we're heavy users of Customize um, at Metal. So it, within Customize, we have a, um, a modules directory. So for any of you that are not familiar with Customize, you essentially have a base and then you have a set of patches or overlays. And that's what takes your kind of vanilla templatized um, YAML files and turns them into, um, say, specific versions that you want to apply to dev or another version that you want to apply to staging. So our underscore modules directory is all of the YAML files, whether those be um, normal manifests or whether those be Helm releases, um, but they do not include environment specific configuration because those are gonna be supplied at the environment specific directories. So dev for development, PRD for production. 
So inside modules, we have a number of different options that we can choose. I, I like to think of this as kind of a pick a mix or an, or an a la carte menu. Not all of these directories have to be deployed to every environment. There's some obvious ones here that will, an example, you know, cluster, um, but things like docs, docs, we have a tools environment. That's where our um, documentation lives. So I want to kind of talk about Istio here as an example. So we have an Istio directory. And then inside the dev directory, we also have the same um, Istio directory. But here is where we specify the dev overlays. So the environment that we're going to point at and also the URLs um, for us to be able to um, talk to um, Pr Prometheus. So we've got a way now and we've got a pattern to construct Helm releases for us to be able to deploy changes or workloads to a platform. But there's always this difficult question, right? How do you handle secrets, right? Do you get the app to do it? Or you know, how, how do you um, deploy these and manage these with inside um, your platform? For us, we use sealed secrets and Flux Plus sealed secrets is, is pretty awesome. Um, so for any of you that are not familiar with um, Bitnami sealed secrets, kind of concept works that again, you have another agent inside the cluster, which has the private key. You seal your secrets with a public key. You can put those in Git because the only thing that can read them is um, the cluster that is running that has the, the corresponding private key. And then we have a dedicated um, Flux instance, which essentially reconciles these sealed secrets. The sealed secrets controller picks them up, turns them into normal Kubernetes secrets, and away we go, we're at the races. So we have all of our secrets declared um, in Git. Very similar kind of structure here. We have a sealed secrets directory and then within that sealed secrets directory, again, the three letter environment prefix. So you can see here that it's flowing through all the repositories um, that we use within Metal. Then coming onto the crux of it. So we've got a way of deploying secrets. We've got a way of deploying, um, you know, different types of workloads or cluster level workloads or platform workloads into the system. But how do we actually deploy metal workloads into the system? So we moved to customize inside platform engineering in the Kubernetes resources um, repository because we wanted to cut ourselves and learn all of the lessons and make all of the mistakes before we, before we kind of got the developers to embrace this as a kind of pattern. So you'll see here that they are um, leveraging customize again, but their directory looks a little bit different. So base is their non-environment specific configuration. And then they just have the three letter environment prefixes for the environment that they want to deploy to. Um, we called tools tools because if we shorten it to TLS, it's going to get very confusing when we're having different types of uh, conversations. So the base directory, as we've kind of alluded to, is this non-environment specific configuration. So again, it's that a la carte menu, that pick and mix, which allows them to pick and choose what products get deployed to um, specific clusters. So let's take the account balance uh, microservice or Helm release here. Um, at the base level. So you'll see here a couple of things. It's pointing to the backend chart. So we, we've constructed a backend chart, which all microservices use. Um, and we have a small set of tweaks to those um, backend charts. So we have um, another one that's kind of a generic chart and then a, another backend chart that is um, from Micronaut. Whole idea being all of the kind of best practices are already in here consistent labeling taxonomy, consistent naming taxonomy, horizontal pod autoscaler, all of the things that you should be doing, um, but we've got them in one location. The thing that you'll notice here is that we don't have the chart version. And the reason for that is that the chart version is specific to the environment or the cluster that we are deploying into. So for any of you remember the Kubernetes 116 release, they deprecated a load of APIs. So for everything that was running on a cluster that was pre-116, the chart version was 1.x. Then we, when we migrated to Kubernetes 116, 
we changed the chart version to 2.x and then for us to know whether your whether your microservice is um, available able to run in um, Kubernetes 116 we changed all of the versions in that environment to 2.x and then flux did the rest for us the final thing here that you'll notice is that we don't have an image tag. And that's because again, the image tag is specific to the environment that we're deploying. In. Then if we have a look at the environment specific directories, they again look very similar to, um, to base, but here is where we start to overlay environment specific configuration. So in dev, we're gonna tell Flux that for this Helm release, we want you to look for new images that have the tag dev dash star we'll provide it with a um, an image to, image tag to start with and then finally we'll specify the the chart version that we want to deploy here so you can see from here that we've got the dev directory and it's looking at a dev um, glob and we've got a dev tag doesn't really take a rocket scientist to work out what staging and production is going to look like right we want to keep the cognitive load down and make it simple for developers to onboard applications. What you also also notice here in this uh, dev directory is this flux patch. So when I was saying before that flux goes to the registry and looks for new images, it also deploys them. And then once it's deployed them, it writes the change back to Git. So we've got now a history of all of the changes or all of the versions of microservices that have been deployed to all environments in a single repository. So this makes auditing easier. It's it's making you know um, our ability to be able to diagnose problems easier. You know, if we had a a problem with the cluster at 4 p.m., we go to this repository. What kind of things got deployed to that environment around you know 3:45 to 4? You know, we've got a way of being able to see changes now. Pretty awesome, right? So now how do we actually perform continuous delivery? So congratulations, Steve, you and the team have constructed a load of repositories and you've got Flux syncing them. Brilliant. But how do you actually make changes, right? That's what everybody needs to know. So we'll start with microservice pipelines. So metal workloads, custom workloads here. How do we make changes to them? So as I alluded to before, we have our repositories in, in GitHub and they are heavy users of, of Concourse. So they perform a Docker build. I've, I've deliberately skipped out a load of steps here. I'm trying to keep this relatively simple. Um, with a tag of dev dash commit SHA, they use the long commit SHA here. We push that up to um, our, our registry or our image registry, sorry, um, GCR with this new tag. So the new tag is sitting there in the image registry and Flux is also sitting inside the cluster and is looking for new image tags. Once it eventually finds one, it patches the Helm release. So the Helm release locally to the Flux pod. Runs a kubectl apply, essentially applies the changes to the cluster and then commits the changes back to Git. In the meantime, Concourse is sitting there and we wrote a little script that's waiting for the update. So because we've got this consistent labeling taxonomy, we have a way now of being able to target um, you know, specific microservices at specific versions. And because the one of the tags we have is app version and the app version value is the value of the image tag, we have a way of being able to ask Kubernetes whether my microservice version has been deployed. Then they perform some testing and then to go to staging, they push another or re tag the Docker image with a new image tag of stage or studge. And uh, then they just test, rinse and repeat. And the value behind this now is that we have got the developers doing the things that developers want to be doing or thinking about or caring about, which is how do I gain confidence to move between environments? They don't care how this thing gets deployed. They don't want to know about like Kubernetes. They don't need to understand the difference between a deployment and a replica set. We want developers to bring value to our customers, right? That's the main thing. All of this other stuff is tooling that enables that to happen, but also get, gives us the consistency. 
So that's microservice versions. But what about Kubernetes manifests? So, you know, how do you handle API deprecations? So here we use Circle CI because we don't need to use Concourse. Um, we don't have any feature tests that are specifically running against these. So the first thing that we do is reuse ConfTest. So what ConfTest does is um, allows us to be able to construct rego policies. So essentially policies that can check um, YAML. And all we are doing here is checking for deprecated APIs. So if you think about this, we, we have this running in our, in our Helm charts um, repo, making sure that we're not using any deprecated API versions. So we're checking against 120 when we're running a cluster of 117. And the reason why we do that is because we want to have relatively strong confidence that when we upgrade the Kubernetes cluster, the same manifests and the same Helm release versions can get deployed successfully. Don't ask me about the 114 to 116. Uh, it was a little bit uh, a little bit of a mess and this tool uh, helped us great, greatly. The next one that we run is kubeval. And what kubeval does is validates the YAML against the uh, upstream JSON schema. So um, shout out to Gareth Rushgrove for creating this. Um, we run it in strict mode and that just makes sure and gives us confidence that the YAML that we're trying to deploy um, matches the YAML that the API is um, expecting and we're not adding new fields. And then the final one is HRVAL. So Stefan Prodan wrote this tool and what this tool does is um, takes your Helm release. So the Helm release, you know, the flux manifest essentially, downloads the chart at the version that you've specified, runs a Helm template using the default values plus the values that you've specified in your um, Helm release, and then runs kubeval against them. Um, but what Dan Volk did in our team, um, shout out to Dan for this, he he actually went a bit further. So we, we customized this slightly, and we now run kubeval and all of our conf tests against our Helm releases. So what this is doing is, is it's just giving us more confidence that by the time it hits Kubernetes, it should apply and the issues that we have are going to be application issues rather than misconfiguration. So how does the kind of cluster come up? So we deploy um, on Amazon Kubernetes. We use Bootcube for this. The first repository that comes up is Kubernetes resources because that's going to do the bare bones um, workloads and configuration. The way that we do that is we point that at a directory. So if we're standing up the dev cluster, we're going to point at the um, at the dev directory with inside of that repository. For any of you that were eagle-eyed, you would have noticed a directory in this modules directory, which is a flux directory. And what this flux directory is, is a load of other fluxes that we need to stand up different or deploy different resources to, to our platform. So the bootstrap one, uh, bootstrap directory here is the first um, flux that we have that we install, we actually overwrite it. So Flux can upgrade Flux, mind's blown. Um, so when Kubernetes resources comes up, we deploy another Flux for Kubernetes releases Metal. That's going to deploy the Metal workloads, secrets for secrets, Kafka topics, because we're heavy users of Kafka. All right, it's getting a little bit boring now, but you kind of get the story. Uh, Calico for network resources, Istio for Istio resources, and they all point at some directory slash this environment prefix, right? And now we have a consistent way of deploying manifests or workloads to, to our platform. So million dollar question, can, can we answer the question now? Yes, thankfully, thankfully we can. It takes us around 25, 27, 30 minutes to do a full teardown of the Kubernetes cluster and to reconcile back to exactly where we were before. If you asked me that question 18 months to two years ago, I would just say unknown or unlimited. I had no way of knowing that. And we've actually recorded this and actually kind of shown this, shown this in practice. So in the last 18 years, 18 years, 18 months to two years, we've successfully completed our mission of being able to tell RBS how long it would take us to rebuild a cluster. 
So I'm going to leave these links on the screen um, for a couple of seconds if you want to take screenshots or whatever. Um, so top half is some of the tooling that we use at Metal. Um, and bottom half is an example of the deprecation policies that we write. A very, very simple um, repo for doing GitOps with customize. And then finally, the, the medium blog posts, which go into a lot more technical detail about how all this stuff works under the covers. And with that, I'm done.